had the pleasure of having uh, Michael Robertson from NYU. Okay. It's actually Michael and I realized that we may have met here you know, back in uh, 1984 when I was uh, an undergrad visiting the, uh, this side of the Atlantic. And, and you were here uh, giving talks. Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> So anyway, um, I won't go over Michael's uh, credential, right? He's a, a well-known figure in optimization and uh, one of the leaders of the field. So we'll go right into his talk, and uh, that's on an unsmooth and uncomplex optimization. Well, thanks, uh, Chris. It's great to be here. Uh, I haven't been here, I've been here many times, but not in um, recent years, so it's great to be back. Okay, so um, I'm not sure where it's at. So, we're, we're interested in uh, the following problem. We want to minimize the function locally because it's going to be too hard to do it locally. We're going to assume the function is continuous, but non differentiable everywhere. That's what makes it interesting, is that it, it, uh, in particular, it's typically not going to be differentiable local minimizers. And it's not convex. If, it, if we knew it was convex, then we would be able to do all sorts of things. But we're not assuming that. We probably, we, in most cases, we will assume it's locally Lipschitz because that uh, otherwise is really difficult. Um, and we can prove something in that case, depending on what object we're talking about. But the key point is I'm not going to assume any structure. Now, if you have a structured problem, there's a lot of other uh, methods. But I'm not going to assume any kind of structure. Okay, so that's, that's the key. Uh, but there is still a lot of interesting applications. Now, any locally Lipschitz function is differentiable almost everywhere. Uh, that, that's uh, rather than Chris theorem, actually. So, with high probability, given a point, you can evaluate the gradient of that point with probability 1 if the point is randomly generated. So, we could just start by asking what's going to happen if we just use gradient descent. Let's just um, go in the steepest descent direction in the two lines and use a standard line search. Well, this is the kind of thing that will happen. So you have, here's this function, nice simple function, it's not smooth on this quadratic, x2 equals x1 squared, and we like to get over here where the minimizer is, because then it's zero. But you see, if you go in the steepest descent direction, you just go across and then back and then across and back, and then steps get shorter and shorter, and you end up converging here, which is nothing special but this point. The function's not smooth there, but it's not uh, in any so that's what happens. Now, <clears throat> it's been known for decades that this kind of thing can happen. Um, but what's interesting is there isn't all that much in the literature about it, really. Uh, there, there are these examples that appeared in the 70s and in the 93 textbook. But these examples are very cooked up. They're cooked up to defeat a, a, an, ex, an exact line search from a specific starting point on a specific function. And so we, a PhD student of mine, we started, we're interested in looking at a very simple question um, and seeing, seeing what happens in that case. I should say that it's very well known that since the 1970s that you can avoid this kind of failure by using sufficiently short step lengths. That's the so-called subgradient method. But this is slow. So we want to see what happens with an inexact line search. So what do I mean by inexact? Well, uh, for several reasons, I'm going to talk about an armijo wolf line search. So what does that mean? Uh, given x with f differentiable at x and d, uh, which is a descent direction, which means that in a product is zero, and those parameters, c1 is the armijo parameter, c2 is the wolf parameter, the armijo condition, which goes back to 1966, says you want to get a sufficient reduction in f, in that sense. So uh, what you'd expect from the uh, first order approximation, uh, t times the gradient, uh, but scaled back by c1. So it's, uh, so it's OK to put less on here. Um, on the other hand, we don't want the step to be too short. And this is why we also consider the, the second condition here, uh, which says that the directional derivative, which is negative at the initial point here, t equals 0, um, so that's a negative number times a positive number. So this number here, the directional derivative of the new point, should be maybe also negative, but less negative, or, or it could change signs to be positive. Um, 
Now, assuming that the function is bounded below along the, along the line, uh, then the Armino condition holds for a sufficiently small t, as you can see, and also the Wolf condition holds for a sufficiently large t. It's also not so hard to show that the intervals overlap. And so combining the two conditions leads to a very convenient bracketing line search. Now, this is what in Nosedown right you would call a weak wolf line search, although it's not a very good name. It's, it's, um, it, it's, it really should be called an Armijo wolf line search. Now, it was actually Powell back in the 70s who was the first to observe so many things who noticed that this combination leads to this very convenient algorithm. And it's just a few lines, sort of parenthetical to mark almost. Um, now, that's in the, 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 this is obvious, more or less, um, that, that you can do this uh, in the smooth case, even the convex case. Actually, it extends to the general local Lipschitz case. Now, we look for Armijo Wolf naturally on the web. Curiously enough, we found somebody called Melissa Armijo Wolf. We found her LinkedIn page. It seems like that was a pretty surprising coincidence. <laughs> um, her parents are not the same on the model wall, so at least really not one of them. <coughs> okay. So what happens then uh, on this for this line search? I'm interested in looking at a very simple function here. You can't imagine a simpler non-smooth function. Uh, it's unbounded below because x2, we can drive x2 to minus infinity, but x1, of course, you you um, you don't want to go to minus infinity, but x2 can go to minus infinity, x1 could be 0. Uh, I'm going to make a greater or equal to 1, because that way f will be bounded below along any direction d. Otherwise, it doesn't make much sense to be talking about line searches, you'll just go straight off to minus infinity. Um, and so then here's a theorem, which is given any x0 now, any x0 at all where the function's differentiable. Uh, define xk in R2, this is a two variable problem, by xk plus 1 equals xk plus tk dk. dk is, this, is the negative gradient. And tk is any step length satisfying the Armijo and Wolf conditions with the Armijo parameter of c1. It doesn't matter what the Wolf parameter is. Um, so you don't, we're not even talking about a specific line search. Okay, So it's pretty general. Um, if, it, if c1 times a squared plus 1 is bigger than 1, it turns out that xk converges to a non-optimal point on the axis with x1 uh, equal zero, uh, which of course you don't want because you'd like the function of values to go to minus infinity. And um, this is actually uh, a joint work with my PhD student, Azam Azal, who was actually a visitor to Patrick in Paris a couple of summers ago. <coughs> now, here's, uh, the, here's just an illustration. So this is the one where A is a little a being 5, c1 equals 0 0.1 is not small enough to get this thing to go to minus infinity because 25 times 0 0.1, 2.5 is bigger than 1, you get convergence to a non optimal point. On the other hand, 4 times 0 0.1 is less than 1, so the function always goes to minus infinity. It goes back and forth all the time, but it'll keep on going forever. Um, the rule condition is when true, you go back and forth across the axis. So. But even if you don't have the wolf condition, it's a similar. So, uh, what what should we do? Um, well, it's been known for years, decades, that we uh, ought to exploit the great information at, at more than one point at a time. How should we do that? Well, the bundle methods of the classical approach, due to Marshall and Kiwiel, those are the two sort of gods of bundle methods, those were very popular in the 1980s and later. Uh, a lot of practical use and theoretical analysis, but they're really complicated in the non uh, context case, so that's why I don't like them. It's very hard to even understand what they do. Um, <clears throat> so there, there is theory in the non complex case, but it's pretty complicated. So what we did is we introduced, and this is already 10 years old now, um, this together with my uh, colleagues Jim Burke and Adrian Lewis, um, we uh, introduced a much simpler method, which has also has nice convergence theory. Then after I talk about that, I'm going to talk about BFGS which many of you will know about that method, um, which is not a method that was introduced with the idea of non-smooth optimization in mind, but it's very, very effective. So let's talk about gradient sampling first. Are there any questions? Oh. Okay. So gradient sampling method, we're going to fix a sample size 
which has to be greater or equal to n plus 1, this is the weakness of this method, it's going to be not practical for the next day. So there's going to be a line search parameter, which is something like an amigo parameter, but the different, and these other two parameters. We'll initialize the so-called sampling radius epsilon tolerance tau and the iterate x, and we'll repeat as follows. Uh, the interloop is going to be gradient sampling with fixed epsilon. We set the set G to be gradient at the current point and gradients at randomly generated nearby points. Um, where epsilon controls what we mean by nearby. Then we look for the shortest vector in the convex hull of those vectors. That's just a quadratic program, so it's easy to solve. Convex quadratic program. If the norm is below the tolerance, we break out of this loop. Otherwise, we do a backtracking line search. It's not exactly, it's not an army hope wolf line search. It's something a bit different. Um, so that's what it is. And if f is not differentiable at this point, which is not very likely if the function is supposed to be Lipschitz, then you should replace it by a nearby point where f is differentiable. Now, that is needed in theory. But uh, we actually don't try to check that in practice. It's pretty difficult to check what the function's differentiable point if you don't have, you know, if you don't have a priori knowledge of the function. If you're only using this sort of oracle where you get uh, function values and gradients, and the idea is for because the function is locally Lipschitz, virtually everywhere we evaluate the function gradient, the gradient will be defined. And then uh, once we break out of that loop. Um, Once we break out of the loop, then uh, we'll reduce uh, epsilon and tau by constant factors and repeat. Okay, so we do the next smaller gradient uh, sampling gradient. So here's what happens. Uh, the, oh, there we go now. So the, um, the the blue is what happened before. The red. Now we start to pick up information about gradients from both sides. That tells you you should go this way. Sort of wanders about a bit. When it gets here, it finds the zero is some convex hull of three gradients generated near this point. Um, maybe one is pointing this way, one is pointing this way, one is pointing this way, something like that. And so it can't do any further, can't go any further in this sampling radius, uh, which was probably initially 0.1. Um, and so then you reduce the sampling radius and continue, and there's actually some yellow points here, but it's very hard to see. But anyway, they get a lot closer to the minimizer and so on. Each time you reduce the sampling radius, it's like blowing up the picture. <coughs> well, to say something about the convergence of this method, I need to define some things. So I'm going to start by defining the Clark subdifferential. So assume that F is local Lipschitz, and uh, let D be the set of points where the function is differentiable. Rademacher's theorem says that's, uh, that's um, almost everywhere. <coughs> The uh, Clark subdifferential is then defined to be the convex hull of all the gradient limits as you approach the point. Um, so, for example, if we were talking about value, um, if you approach the point zero from this side, you have plus one. Approach from this side, you have minus one for the gradient. So the convex hull is the con uh, the convex hull is the interval from minus one to one. So that's a very simple example of the Clark subdifferential. <coughs> Okay, so actually Clark called it the generalized gradient. So this is um, getting on for uh, half a century old. Like that. Um, so if F is continuously differentiable at this point, then the, sub then the generalized gradient is precisely the gradient. If it's continuously differentiable, not necessarily just if it's differentiable. Uh, and if F is convex, it's just the ordinary subdifferential uh, convex analysis from some loop, loop precursor. Um, and we think that x bar is Clark stationary if uh, if zero is in the subdifferential Clark subdifferential at a point. So if it's just a gradient, we mean the gradient zero. And the key point is that the convex hull of the set G generated by uh, gradient sampling is a surrogate uh, for the subdifferential. <coughs> so uh, I've just shown this picture again to show what is the Clark subdifferential in this, uh, at this interesting point here where we have a minimizer. Well, you have one gradient, 
one negative gradient from this side pointing in this direction, one negative gradient from this side pointing in this direction. They're equal and opposite. Uh, well, they're opposite directions. So zero is in their convex hull. And, um, uh, and so uh, at that point, it's hard to take care of. So here's the convergence theorem. Suppose that F is locally Lipschitz, continuously differentiable on open full measure subset of Rn as bounded level sets. Then with probability one, remember there's a sampling going on randomly, F is differentiable to sample points, the line search always terminates, and if the sequence of iterates converges to some point, then with probability one, the inner loop always terminates. So that means that the sampling radii and tolerances are reduced in increments of time, so they must go to zero. And they, that point x bar is clock stationary. Uh, so we proved that. And then actually, Kiwiel very nicely proved this. Um, he dropped the assumption that F had bounded level sets, and he was able to show that with probability one, uh, either the sequence goes to minus infinity, which of course is fine, or every cluster point of the sequence is Clark stationary. It's just about as strong as all the super cluster. And this is actually a great example of why you should publish your work, because Kiwiel actually read it in Poland and improved it. <coughs> And we've also extended this to constraint problems, uh, where the constraints are also locally Lipschitz but may not be differentiable as local minimizers. We have a successive quadratic programming gradient sampling method with convergence theory. This is joint with Frank Curtis. Okay, so now let's switch topics to BFGS. But first I'll talk about quasi methods in general. So Bill Davidon was a physicist at Argonne who in the 50s, uh, late 50s, he was trying to do Newton's method, it was too expensive, too slow. Um, so he had a very smart idea of, uh, uh, of um, having, making an approximation to the inverse Hessian using gradient differences. And using that inverse Hessian approximation, then you just multiply it onto the negative gradients, the surrogate for Newton's method. And the key point being that you could update the approximation you know, of n squared time instead of open and it's each, each one differs from the previous one by rank two. So of course the paper was rejected because it was so ahead of its time. Um, but it was, however, published 30 years later in the first issue of Science Journal of Optimization. That was John Dennis's brilliant idea to solicit the paper. But, uh. Now, there's an interesting story here about Davidon, because he was a well-known anti-war protester. And uh, five years ago, almost four years ago, but it was revealed that he was actually the mastermind behind a break-in, a, a famous break-in of the FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania, during the Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, World Heavyweight Long Six Championship, which most of you are too young to remember, but Tim probably remembers. <laughs> uh, everybody in the country is watching TV, including the security guards, I guess. <coughs> then Fletcher and Powell came onto the scene in 1963. They improved the method and established convergence uh, for convex quadratic functions. And they applied it to big data, 100 variables, that's that was a lot in those days. Um, it became known as the DFP, Dabla and Fletcher Powell method. Sadly, they all died in the last few years. BFGS is, stands for Broid and Fletcher Goldfarb and Chano. It's a kind of a duel to the DFP method. It's remarkable that they all came up with it at the same time with different, um, different um, derivations, but based, of course, on DFP. And <laughs> A little bit later, Boyden, Dennis, and Murray proved local superlinear convergence of BFJS and BFP and other methods. Powell then, in a really great paper, established convergence of BFJS with an inexact or amino wolf line search. Wolf condition is crucial here uh, for a general class of smooth complex functions. This was extended by these guys to include the whole class of methods interpolating BFJS and BFP, except for DFP. Uh, now, there actually are pathological counterexamples to convergence in the smooth, non-convex case. These guys are the masters of working on the dark side to, uh, to defeat these methods. But their, their methods are very, the, the examples that defeat the method are very artificial and not, uh, not stable under perturbation. So in general, it's very widely accepted that the method works well in the smooth, non-convex case, meaning it converges to local minimizers or at least stationary points, generally. So what is a method anyway? Uh, we start with an iterate and um, a symmetric matrix H, which is most approximately the inverse Hessian, it's like the choice of letter H. 
uh, we compute this so-called quasi Newton direction, the approximate inverse Hessian tensor gradient. We obtain T from our Nico Wolf. We um, uh, that now look at those two vectors there, which is the difference of the axis and the difference of the gradients. We replace update x and then update h by that formula. It, it looks like a rank three correction, but it turns out it's actually rank two. Um, key point is that this can be computed at all events squared time because v is a rank one perturbation we have And the Wolf condition guarantees that s transpose y is positive. That's just a one line um, proof. And it then follows that the UH is called the depth of <clears throat> Well, what about the non smooth case? Well, it turns out way back in the 80s, that early 80s, in fact, that Lamar Schall observed that quasi Newton methods could be effective for non smooth optimization. He's almost a throwaway line on a technical report. But he dismissed them. He said, there's no theory, and don't know how to terminate them. And that was that. And then there's very little in the literature until a paper of Adrian Lewis and myself a few years ago, which where we address those issues. Unfortunately, we can't prove a whole lot, though. Now, <coughs> key point here is to use this Armijo Wolf line search, which insists on an increase, algebraic increase to that directional derivative, which is negative at the starting point of the line search. Now, if you read No Style and Write, for instance, they basically, maybe they, maybe they don't come on and advocate it, but they talk a lot about Strong Wolf, which says that um, you should reduce the magnitude of the directional derivative along the line. That was sort of a uh, a bunch of people in the sort of nonlinear optimization world had that opinion. Uh, it, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do if the function is smooth, but in the non smooth case, it's a disaster because uh, there's, well, I guess you can't even see it, but for the absolute value function, see the directional derivative is constant in absolute value. <coughs> so, what happens is that BFGS builds a very ill conditioned inverse Hessian approximation because you see this. this Absolute value function can be approximated, could be, you could imagine it being approximated by a very ill conditioned quadratic, right? Clearly. And so the FGS, when it gets these huge gradient differences, basically uh, does its thing and it amounts to saying, look, there's very high curvature in those directions in the inverse Hessian, or in the Hessian, very, uh, very tiny eigenvalues corresponding to the inverse Hessian. Amazingly, the condition number of the inverse Hessian approximation typically reaches the inverse of the machine precision before it breaks down. And I say amazingly because as a numerical analyst, I was just to totally astounded by this when I first saw it. By break, what do I mean by breaks down? Well, in, in theory, it should keep on going forever, but because of rounding, eventually, it won't be able to get a reduction in the line search. <coughs> We've never seen convergence to non stationary points that can't be explained by numerical difficulty. And the rate convergence rate is typically linear, which is nice. It's not super linear, but it's a lot better than uh, nothing. So there's the there's what happens with the FGS. It's a block. It takes a little while to sort of get, get going with this second order of approximation, but eventually it goes along to there, and we don't need more than one phase if it goes there. So I'm going to try and convince you that this method is pretty amazing by this example. Uh, it comes from an application. Sn is the space of real n by n symmetric matrices. And we want to minimize the product of the largest n over 2 of the eigenvalues, the symmetric matrix of the eigenvalues are real. And uh, that is not a convex function. If it was the sum of the largest k eigenvalues, the largest n over 2 eigenvalues, um, the log is just a scale, for um, And uh, a here is a fixed data matrix, and this is the Hadamard product, the conformalized product of the fixed data with the variable. Okay, so the product, the product of all of them would be the determinant, which is a concave function. Uh, but the product of half of them is something special, it's either convex or concave in general. And then we also have these constraints that x is positive semi-definite has value on the to the one. Now, if we replace the product by the sum, that would just be a semi-definite program. But since the function is not convex, we may as well do this trick of setting x equal to y by transpose. That gets rid of the fossil semi-definite constraint. Maybe also to eliminate the diagonal constraint. So it just becomes a constraint on some problem. And it comes in an application from an application. So here's what happens when I run from 10 randomly generated starting points with CFGS. Uh, I'm just showing the results after the line search, um, not, not the in between points. And see, they all basically find approximately the same point. 
Now, this, what am I showing here? I'm showing the function value minus the best known function value, f of, which is actually the one that this run found. That's why this looks like superlinear convergence here, because um, this was what's being subtracted is the one that this one converges to. But really it's just one. <coughs> now, what I'm showing here is the eigenvalues of this product a circle x, the component-wise product. So we're minimizing the product the largest 10 eigenvalues of this 20 by 20 matrix, this 400 variables. Um, and I'm plotting here lambda 1 through lambda 20. And what, what you see here is that very quickly a bunch of them coalesce. In fact, nine of them coalesce. Lambda 6 through lambda 14, just in this particular case. Um, so that's not so surprising because you're trying to push down a bunch of eigenvalues, and so the others tend to come up and meet them. And this happens with semi definite programming and related off convex optimization problems, too. So we're very familiar with that. <clears throat> and we don't know exactly how many will coalesce. In this case, it turned out to be nine of them. Uh, I'm also showing here the um, eigenvalues of the inverse Hessian approximation. And you see 44 of them went to zero. Now, why? The rest didn't. So I'm going to now give a somewhat arm-waving, but I think convincing argument as to why 44 of them went to zero. But to do that, I first have to tell you a little bit more theory. So let me introduce the notion of regularity, which also goes back to Clark in the 70s. Um, <coughs> so a locally Lipschitz directionally differentiable function is regular near a point x when its directional derivative is upper semi-continuous there for every fixed direction. It sounds like a bit of a mouthful, but again, if you think back about the absolute value function here, the directional derivative uh, so just imagine this B shape for those who can't see. The directional derivative, when I go from the right to in this direction, the directional derivative is um, negative, because the function's dropping down, until I get to zero, then suddenly it jumps up to plus one. So it's minus one, jumps up to plus one. So it jumps up, so it's upper semi-continuous. If we looked at the negative absolute value function, it would be jumping down, and that would not be regular. So it turns out that in this case, Stark Clark stationarity is equivalent to the first order optimality condition. Directional derivative is non negative in every direction, which is a nice property. So all convex functions are regular, all smooth functions are regular, but non smooth concave functions are not regular. So now we go one step further and talk about partly smooth functions. A regular function is partly smooth at a point x relative to a manifold m which contains x if its restriction to m, the manifold, is twice continuously differentiable near the point. The Clark sub subdifferential, so that's the function, the Clark subdifferential of f is uh, continuous on the manifold near the point. And Okay, there's a bit of a multiple again. The subspace parallel to the affine hull of the subdifferential at the point is exactly the subspace normal to the manifold at the point. So let me show you by example. So looking at the same picture again. Um, so the, I mentioned before that the Clark subdifferential consists of vectors in these directions. Okay, and so what you see is the affine hull of those vectors, uh, and you could shift it to the origin in the subspace is orthogonal to the tangent space of the manifold at this point. So that, that means that's the that condition. Um, we refer to this uh, this direction, the orthogonal direction, as the B space direction, and the tangent direction as the U space direction. And for non zero vectors in the B space, the mapping is necessarily this mapping. It's in other words, the function in those directions is necessarily non smooth when you cross over the manifold. While for non zero vectors in the U space, which is in the tangent direction, the function is necessarily differential in that direction as long as that's the sort of directions. Okay. And this is related to some of the work of Murphy Murray and Steve Wright, uh, and also from our shell news. Now, why did 44 eigenvalues convert to zero? Well, the eigenvalue product, which is a non-smooth function when you break the multiplicity 
is partly smooth with respect to the manifold of matrices with an eigenvalue with a given multiplicity. And so in other words, as long as you don't break the multiplicity, just keep the eigenvalues together, then things are smooth in that manifold. That's a manifold. And recall that nine of them coalesced. Now it turns out that matrix theory says, and this really goes back to the 1920s, that imposing a multiplicity M on an eigenvalue uh, of a matrix um, in Sn is M times N plus one over two conditions, minus one because I'm not telling you what the value of the eigenvalue is. Well, for M equals nine, nine times 10 over two is 45 minus one is 44. Well, that's not a coincidence. Okay, this is what BFGS figured out from, it had 44 eigenvalues of the inverse Hessian approximation going to zero, suggesting that the function's partly smooth on a manifold for which the, uh, the, the, uh, the tangent space has dimension or co-dimension 44. <coughs> so BFGS automatically figured out these space spaces without knowing anything. I mean, it didn't know anything about this coming from an eigenvalue problem. Now, just to be more convincing, um, let me show you this picture. This plots the function, the, the function that we're minimizing, along a line passing through the computed optimal point. What line? The various eigenvectors. So if you look along the eigenvectors for the first 40 eigenvalues of the Hessian, the first 44 in fact, let's take for instance eigenvalue number 10, you see the function is not smooth. But if you look at number 50, the eigenvalue, the, the function is actually smooth. So, BFG has figured this out, which are the directions where the function is smooth and the function is not smooth. I think that's amazing. I wish we could prove it. <clears throat> so if there's anybody very smart here who has nothing to do. Okay. Well, actually, here, that's the next slide. So here's what we'd like to do. Assume that F is locally ellipsis. Make, let's make, uh, make a nice assumption that F is semi-algebraic. Um, assume the X and H are generated randomly. We would just prove that the following hold of trouble we want. We have GS generates an infinite sequence of points with that differential all this. Any cluster point is part stationary. Sequence of function values observed linearly, because that's what we observe, and that you have in the end this property of this division of the two subspaces with the number of eigenvalues of H, the eigenvalues of H to go to zero corresponding to the mean space. Well, this is what we'd like to prove, but we're nowhere near anything. But we do have plenty of success stories of using VFGS for non smooth problems. The main one, which I've worked on a lot, is the design of fixed order controllers for linear dynamical systems uh, with input and output, joined with DDA on real. And many subsequent users have used this, uh, our toolbox type food, for very many different applications. Um, shape optimization of spectral functions for Dirichlet Laplacian operators. This guy was a student at Columbia, a PhD student, came to see me. Have some optimization problem, which I do. I said use BFGS. Okay, so we did that and it worked perfectly. <coughs> and same story with uh, Paolo Boyko and Jean Pierre Dutier. And software is available in case you want to use it. Uh, we've also extended this to um, uh, combine BFGS gradient. Uh, I meant to say, oh no. I guess, no, that's not my work, that's why I didn't write this. That's Frank Ferguson's work with it, too. And then we also have constraint problems, uh, uh, and here we've done an SQP VFGS method. Uh, and applied to problems from control, the results were pretty nice, but we couldn't prove anything. So. But it's much better than the method for which we can prove stuff. <coughs> and we also have software for that. Right, so. Okay, so I want to finish up by showing you some examples, some sort of nasty examples. So this is an example, uh, a diabolical example of Nesterov, which I like to call his Chebyshev Rosenbrock function. So the function is has a quadratic term, and then this sum here, which looks strange. You'll see why it is there in that choice. The P here is going to typically be one or two. Uh, the minimizer, no matter what it is, is be all ones because then this thing vanishes and this also vanishes and you get zero which is 
the lowest possible value. And it's unique. But if you start over here with just the first variable having the wrong sign, then basically what you have to do is get all the way along this manifold from this point to this point. The manifold is the uh, is the, the set of points where this thing is zero. So that's what that's basically what the FGS does. It follows that manifold, but only approximately. Okay, and it could get lucky and jump jump ahead. But otherwise, it might have to follow fairly closely with the line search. Uh, when p equals two, the problem is smooth. Remember, okay. So starting at this point, uh, n equals five takes 370 iterations. That's quite a few for five variables to get down to machine precision. n equals ten takes 50,000 iterations. Wow, why so many? Even though the function is smooth. And then at the very end, we get superlinear convergence, which shows you the sort of limitations of the superlinear convergence property. You know, it's not a global property. It's a global property. It might take a very long time to fit such in. Uh, why? Well, it has to do with Chebyshev polynomials. So that's the formula for the second Chebyshev polynomial. And that xi plus 1 is the, the second Chebyshev polynomial of xi, which is t2 of t2 of xi minus 1. Okay, that's by recursion, and so, so, um, so we keep on going there, and you get this recursion. And it turns out one of the properties of Chef Chef polynomials that this is the same as t to the two, the, the two to the i Chef Chef polynomial. So to move from that x hat to x star along the manifold, you have to move x one from minus one to one. X two has to follow the graph of the t two second Chef Chef polynomial. X3 has to follow the graph of the fourth Chebyshev polynomial, and so on. Xn has to follow the graph of the t to the of the two to the n minus one Chebyshev polynomial. Well, that has a lot of oscillations, namely two to the n minus one of them. It's two to the n minus one minus one extrema. So BFGS won't follow it, won't track it exactly, but it will follow it approximately. It's the same story, by the way, with Newton's method. But that's why. Nestor poked this up because he wanted to show the Newton's method can be quite inefficient. Um, okay, so it ends up taking relatively short steps. Now, here's the first non-smooth variation where I take away the square there. Remember, there was a p and p equals two previously. Now p equals one. So now this is the sum of absolute values here. <coughs> so it's not smooth on that manifold because the sign changes as you cross over it. It's smooth on the manifold. It's not smooth as you cross over. Um, it's, it, you know, it's regular and partly smooth at x with respect to the manifold. Well, we initialize BFGS randomly, not at a special point anymore, because the function is not branchable there. n equals 5, we get down to 10 to minus 2 in 10,000 iterations. Uh, n equals 10, uh, not, not much. I don't know how much worse, but still not very good. But however, it does seem to be converging though, um, very, very slowly. And, and having no difficulties, most likely. Well, here's a second variation where instead of having xi squared here, I can look for the absolute value of xi. Now there's two nested absolute values. Again, it's about the same global minimizer, but this set now, which makes these guys all zero, that's not a manifold anymore. It has corners because of the absolute value. And so here's the first one, and here's the second one. Okay. So the first one, uh, everything is partly smooth on this quadratic. The function is partly smooth on the quadratic. The second one is not partly smooth because this is not a manifold. This is the V shape here. Now the different colored uh, curves here are just the behavior of BFGS from randomly generated starting points. Over here they all converge to here. Over here they mostly converge to here, but some of them converge to this point. That's not a local minimizer. Um, that's the point zero minus one. Now that point is Clark stationary for the second uh, variation. How do I know? Because from this direction, the gradient, negative gradient says to go this way. This direction says to go this way. From this direction says to go this way. From this direction says to go this way. Those all coalesce at the point there. So zero is certainly in the convex hull of the gradient of the limiting gradients of the point. Um, 
So it is part station. However, it's not a local minimizer because that direction, um, in other words, the direction from this part station point towards the minimizer, that's a direction linear step. So that's not possible for a regular function. So the function is not regular. As it turns out, this function has two of the n minus one stationary points. Only local minimizer is the local minimizer, and x star is the only stationary point in the sense of Mordekovich, which I know at least one person here understands. Uh, <coughs> and so that's a nice example of, of the strength of the Mordekovich theory. Um, so that was proved together with uh, what well, was my student, Mert, who uh, worked for the details of that. And furthermore, VFGS finds all two Lian minus one stationary points. So Clark stationary points. So, so this is n equals five. Um, there's uh, sixteen of them here. Two Li n minus one. Yeah. What does it mean this, this picture? Well, I ran it from a thousand different starting points and I sorted the final values. So you see about a, 125 or something, I, I managed to find the optimal value of zero. But for the others, I found various higher points, which were all part stationary values. All two of them. That's one of them here. There's 32 of them. This is equal six. <coughs> so that was also kind of interesting that we have GS finds them all. Um, so this is an interesting behavior that when the function is smooth, when, when the function is smooth, convergence of methods such as the FGS or Unix method to non-locally minimizing stationary points or local maxima, that's really not likely. I mean, it could happen with the Unix method, right? It could converge to a saddle point, but only if you cook it up so it happens. Um, <coughs> because of the line search just in general to have reduction. Um, if you start and start to take a saddle point, for instance, you're stuck. Um, <coughs> but that's not going to be, that behavior is not stable under perturbation. But here it is. This kind of convergence is stable under perturbation. It doesn't matter about the starting points. A bunch of them will go to these non regular, non smooth uh, Clark stationary points that are not local minimizing. Same thing happens with gradient sampling with bundling methods. In fact, Kiwi all told me that this example is the first one he's seen where his bundle code has this behavior. That was kind of surprising because. Kiwiel for years has been proving convergence to Clark stationary points, but he never had examples of cases where the method actually might converge to a non-minimizing uh, point, which is a Clark stationary point. But we still want to know this could be a function of the, of the rounding. Uh, how do we know if it really, really have convergence sequences converging to these points? And it seems from the experiments of master students that the higher the precision you use, the more likely you get away from these. But I don't know, it's not very convincing. I'm not sure. Okay, we still have some time here. So let's talk about limited memory methods. Now, when people talk about BFGS in the 21st century, they almost always mean limited memory BFGS. In fact, the only person who generally doesn't is me. Uh, because full BFGS is way too expensive these days, and it's huge. You can't do O of n squared work or O of n squared space. So what do they do? They do something that NOSA and others introduced in the 1980s, which uh, uses O of n space and time. Basically, what you do is you just save the most recent k rank 2 updates to an initial inverse Hessian approximation. But this is a very heuristic kind of method. Jorge is the first to agree with this. Um, there's two versions with and without scaling. Somehow scaling is supposed to be preferred. Um, this is a linear conversion method, not scaling. It, it, it does pretty well. I mean, people use it a lot, but there's no theory, uh, except well, there is theory, but it's not very understood very well um, why it works well as opposed to just working. How effective is it on non smooth problems? Well, so we tried this eigenvalue product problem here. So the x axis here is the number of updates that I keep. So the, the, the blue dots and the black dots are limited memory BFGS with and without scaling. And that's the final value that I get down to, 10 to the minus 2. Well, that's not very good, considering that with full BFGS, uh, without, with scaling, scaling then this refers to the initial Hessian approximation, um, uh, would be down to 10 to the minus 5, and without, 10 to the minus, um, almost 10 to the minus 4. So, memory is not very good. Uh, 
I, what I was really hoping to see was that when we hit 44, it would suddenly uh, work much better, because that's the dimension of the v-space. But that was not to be. <coughs> So here's another nasty problem for Nesterov. Uh, consider this problem, max of, of absolute x1 and then absolute xi minus 2xi minus 1. I can't see that sort of recursion going on. It's not the same problem. Um, and consider this x half here for x tilde, actually. OK. Well, the, because I'm saying xi tilde to be 2xi tilde minus 1 plus 1, um, uh, it turns out that f of x tilde is 1, but the norm on the other hand of x tilde is 2 to the n. So that means it's a it's got nastily conditioned level sets uh, because uh, f of the vector of all 1s is also 1, and so the function value is the same, but the difference between x tilde and the vector of 1s in norm is huge. So the level sets are very real conditioned. They're sort of diamond shape, right? It's a non split column. But, but nastily, uh, nastily conditioned diamonds, it's thin, uh, and squashed in various directions. So the minimizer is zero, clearly. Now here's a smooth variant with soft max, which uh, yeah, they learned about from the Greek. Um, so soft max is what you, what you do is you exponentiate these various guys here. Uh, where you first divide them by mu, and mu is going to be small, so that makes the biggest one enormous, and the rest won't matter much. And then you undo it by taking the log and multiply by mu. And that is going to converge point-wise to the, um, to, the, uh, to, to, the um, to the function f, which is the max. So the soft max converges point-wise to the function f as the smoothing parameter goes to zero. And the, the reason there's two of them well, we have plus or minus here, right? And, um, and so I can use soft max of, of, of all two n terms. Now, what does this say? Well, what it says is that DFGS is pretty amazing because this is the smoothing parameter now, starting from uh, one or uh, maybe a bit more than one, and going down to 10 to the minus 20. So as the smoothing parameter decreases, the problem gets more and more nasty, more and more ill, more and more ill-conditioned, more and more non-smooth, if you like. Um, but BFGS, which is a dark blue, uh, does very well. Now, limited memory with 10, uh, 10 corrections does pretty well, too. Okay? So basically, uh, why, why this straight line here? Because uh, it's basically finding the exact minimizer of the soft max function, which is converging to the to the minimizer of the max function, as which is zero, as um, the mu parameter goes to zero. So it's getting essentially the exact right answer to to the to as far as we can see, except except what's going on over here. What's going on over here is around here. Okay, that machine position. On the other hand, DFGS with five corrections does terribly. So well, that's not good. Now, that was 100 variables. Suppose I go up to 400 variables. Well, now 10 corrections also does terribly. But OBFGS still does really well. Uh, it's, it's behaving just as well for the nasty, ill-conditioned, very nearly non-smooth problems as it is for the smooth problems. I mean, they're all smooth, actually, except for the 10 to the minus 20 one, which where I just plugged in the max value. But, but, um, but here you have round. This is all just rounded. But the point is that that the uh, <clears throat> the sort of uh, I mean, you're, you're you're getting closer and closer to a non smooth function in a certain sense. That's the new goal. This is the number of iterations. It's pretty much independent of mu for BFGS, which is again rather surprising. It doesn't seem to matter that the problem is becoming more more conditioned. That's a bit surprising. You'd think it would be, as a function becomes more and more ill-conditioned, these, these are all smooth functions, but they're increasingly ill-conditioned. You think it would take more directions, but it doesn't. Okay. These, these ones, the red ones, just run into the, the maximum value of 10,000. Uh, in principle, BFGS is super linear everywhere for all positive mu. But again, uh, 
you, that, that behavior is going to presumably deteriorate as we go to zero, and we really don't detect support conditions. So we're really working on kind of global versions of behavior. And there's uh, about the 400 variable. Then even, even the five variable, uh, five correction in the memory map that runs up to uh, into a brick wall. Okay, so I like to say that limited memory PFPS is, is limited effectiveness in the non-smooth case, um, even when the dimension of V space is smaller than the size of the memory. And actually, Azam has some nice new results on this, but I'm going to go into that. Um, we've also investigated limited memory gradient sampling, where we don't try and sample so many uh, vectors, uh, so, many, so many gradients. That didn't work pretty well either, although Frank, uh, Frank actually has some results for this. He didn't actually look more closely at that. Okay, what, if, what else could you do? Well, the most important thing, you shouldn't go away from this talk thinking that non-smooth optimization is impossible. Uh, on the contrary, many non-smooth, non-complex problems have structure which can be exploited, for example, with proximal point methods, which Patrick is, um, is very much uh, uh, an expert and originator, uh, or the alternating direction method, multipliers method, you may be very familiar with these uh, methods. Those work pretty well, um, but they need to know about the structure of the plane. Um, then, then you can do smoothing, but again, you need to know about the structure of the problem. So that's the next problem. Adaptive gradient sampling is something Frank has done with the student. Um, and there's some very interesting work of Andreas Grewank, actually, on uh, automatic differentiation, automatically detecting non-smoothness with the compiler, basically where it recognizes essentially maps and apps and does the appropriate thing. And I, I think in the long term that might really be the way to go, but not there yet. So to finish, um, gradient descent frequently fails on non-smooth problems. Gradient sampling is a simple method for non-smooth non-complex optimization, but I wish we had a nice convergence theory, but it's too expensive for most applications. EFGS the full version is remarkably effective, a little three known. It's also too expensive for large problems, but it's a lot less expensive for gradient sampling. Limited memory BFGS is not so great, unfortunately, on uh, not some problems. And these diabolical problems can be very difficult. And we have this software that's available. And here are a bunch of papers that uh, everything I talked about is in one, one place or the other. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we have time for a few uh, questions. What happens if you don't store enough vectors in the gradient on the line? Uh, it doesn't look very well. Oh, okay. So you, it's, that's a that requirement is serious, not just to make a proof happen. That's what I meant in the last bit there, where I said that, um, uh, limited memory gradient sampling doesn't work very well. Okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, I mean, again, what I was hoping is that if the bench of the V space is small, then maybe you only have to have about that many vectors. But no. I mean, maybe if you could sample them in the right place, that would be okay, but you can't do that right now. Do, do, do you get a lot of uh, test examples from the machine learning people? Well, um, I don't get them, but there certainly are a lot out there. <laughs> yeah, we should be looking at that stuff. And, and because what, what, what they, don't they replace the gradient with this sequence? Oh, that's the stochastic gradient method? Yeah. yeah. That's a big thing, is stochastic gradient method. Um, uh, that's to, that, that's for two reasons. One, to make the method more efficient, and the other is to sort of smooth things out. Yeah, that's right. Okay, do we have more remarks or questions? Yeah. How important is the uh, uh, license? Maybe the license is? Well, again, if you talk to machine learning people, they don't do license. They say it's way too expensive. Um, and I'm sure it is in their, you know, in their setup. So what they do is they have a, a small parameter, which they call the learning rate. Um, but you know, how do they know how, what to set that to? Well, sort of, you know, they do. They have experience with related problems. Let's try 10 minus three. It doesn't work very well. What 10 minus two? You know, it's very kind of ad hoc and heuristic. Not to say it doesn't work. I mean. Anybody who's used Google Translator or anything else built on machine learning, I mean, it's pretty amazing. But um, it's not understood very well how it all works. 
Okay, um, so let me add that uh, Michael will talk again tomorrow on a completely different topic, the Puzek's uh, conjecture uh, in the uh, Manual Analysis Seminar, uh, in room, uh, what, where? Wait. Who's announcement again? So. Okay. Right. okay, well, thank you again.